Hi, and welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. I'm your host, Mark Philpot, and on today's show, I have another great guest lined up. Just imagine for a minute traveling the world as a rock star. I'm sure that's the secret fantasy of many of us out here. Well, today, my guest is somebody who's actually done that, and we're going to hear all about that particular journey, but we're also going to hear about what happens to life after being a rock star. It's a very warm welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show to Miss Kyla You, Kyla, welcome to the show today. So it's a very warm welcome to Kyla You to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. Kyla, how are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. And I've got to start off by saying happy Thanksgiving to you in America today. Yes, I had a big traditional meal of turkey and mashed potatoes and I'm feeling quite nice today. Do you know that all of us non-Americans get quite jealous of the uh, excuse that you use to eat another lovely meal like that? (laughs) Do they really? (laughs) I'm sure you guys got your own excuses of holidays, (laughs) eating holidays. (laughs) So whereabouts in the US are you today talking to us from? I'm based in Los Angeles and it's actually really freezing here today. Oh, is it really? Yeah, we get um, we get just about uh, probably a month or two of cold weather here, but it's it's quite cold. Maybe it's cold just from my perception. It may not be cold as compared to some really cold areas. I was going to say, a lot of us outside of the U.S. don't really perceive um, the City of Angels getting a lot of cold weather, but the fact is that it actually does get quite chilly there sometimes. We're also babies, though. I want to start off by thanking you very much uh, for coming on the show today. And one of the things that I do with each of my guests is I offer you the opportunity to actually dedicate this particular episode to someone special in your life. So who would you like to dedicate this show to today? Well, it's Thanksgiving and I would love to dedicate the show to my mom, who's always loved me unconditionally and um, she was a little questionable about my career choices being a strict tiger mom, but now she has come on board. Fantastic. And what's your mum's name? Uh, Wendy. Wendy. Okay, Wendy, this is a shout out from Mark and the Global Travel Channel and a wonderful dedication from your daughter. Have you been on many podcast shows before? Um, I've been on a few, yeah. I see that you're... Um, quite active on the media so I've had to work hard today to come up with some questions you've never been asked before so oh wow. <laughs> we'll have to see how I go now we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff today from travel uh, traveling as a rock star to travel blogging and a best-selling book that you've just got out also something you've been involved in recently but I wanted to, I wanted to start off by asking you can you remember your first ever overseas travel experience oh that's difficult I guess my parents, again, my mom took me traveling. She was just saying the other day, since I was three, she's been taking me traveling all around the world. I obviously don't remember that trip, but my first travel experience is probably, I'd remember going to Taiwan, where my extended family is from, and we would visit there every every two years for summer visit. Mm. Do you do you recall one of the early visits and what your first impressions were of Taiwan as a as a country? Oh yeah, I remember a very vivid memory because I'm a huge foodie and Taiwan's definitely one of the foodie destinations in the world, like one of the top ones. But I remember going outside behind my grandmother's house and there's just food everywhere because there's the street carts and they could pop up everywhere and they live right in the city. Mm. So I went there and I remember I was by myself and I had some change in my pocket, some uh, Taiwan yuan, and I had like 10 cents worth of change and I bought myself a hot steaming noodle soup and it was the delicious, most delicious thing I've ever had still. And for 10 cents, that's a bargain. Yeah, it's quite, (laughs) and it's still very, very cheap there. So what about other impressions from some of those first trips to Taiwan that, uh, you know, you're outside of the U.S. traveling for for the first times and and were there other impressions other than the food that really made you think about, wow, this traveling thing is really neat? Yeah, it was just like 
being away from home and being transported to a different place, I think it kind of just changes your whole mindset about things. So it really opened my mind mm. to kind of more creative ideas that I wouldn't have just at home. And I just loved all the different sights and sounds and Taiwan's so different from the United States and I, I, I love LA very much, but Taiwan's definitely one of my favorite places in the world and I just love the hustle mm. and bustle of it. I love that food is open on the street till 2 a.m. and everybody's karaoke all the time. That's just like a daily pastime. And um, mm. yeah, it's just I just love going to different places and being transported into seeing how people lead their lives so differently from mine. It's really transformed as a travel destination, Taiwan. I remember years ago, it was really a place where you only went to if you were transferring on a flight going either westbound or eastbound. But these days, it's definitely a, a tourist destination with so many of the things that you just mentioned. And for the listeners out there, if you haven't been to Taiwan yet, I'd definitely recommend put it on your bucket list because as Kai has just uh, explained, it's definitely a food paradise, but it's also surprisingly got a lot of amazing nature, hasn't it, Kyla? It does. And I haven't even explored the whole extent of Taiwan, but then near Taiwan, there's a bunch of hot springs. So you can go and go to hotels with hot springs water being piped directly into your room. If you drive even further down south, there's amazing beaches and surf destinations. And yeah, in between there, there's a lot of different nature and different biking trips that you can take. Mm. When were you last back there? When was your last trip there? Gosh, I feel like it's been two years, so I'm about due mm. for a trip. Mm. Well, get that backpack on and get over there and find some of those springs and, and mountains to walk in as well. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, food's been a really big part of your life, but so has music. When did music first come on to the scene in your life journey? Uh, well, I guess as many, I was always passionate about music very young. Um, you know, you listen to music to deal with certain situations in your life or you're inspired by musicians to achieve more. Um, so I had my favorite artists. Uh, and I guess I always knew that I was passionate about music, but I didn't really know that it was a real career that I could pursue, especially for the fact that there still aren't really very many Asian Americans in music in the States. But it's kind of great that K-pop is making a huge move in the United States so and around the world. But I guess when I got into college, I grew up in a very strict family. So when I went off to college, I had a lot more freedom to pursue my own personal passions. And I just had that in my mind, like maybe I can pursue – music as a career. I had that idea, but I had no idea how to do it. And it was mm. maybe the third year of college that I started pursuing music. I just went out there blindly and started asking people, mm. like, how do you produce a song? How do you do a recording studio, et cetera? Was there, was there anything else that was kind of a burning option as far as career choices went at that stage at college? Or was, it, was music really dominating your whole um, mindset? Well, it's kind of a really weird detour, but I got into the, um, I don't know if you watch Fast and Furious, but there used to be like a car show scene, an import car show scene in the United mm. States. So I started modeling in that industry, I guess maybe when I was a sophomore in college and I toured all over the United States. And then I saw different kind of indie performers performing at all of those shows. So that's kind of where I got to see that there were artists out there, musicians who were doing their thing and not yet signed to a major label. It's interesting how travel has that impact on your career choices, isn't it? You went out there and you did the modeling thing and you came across the music connection, so to speak, that really helped you to develop some of that thought process. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So what happened then? How, how did it evolve from that kind of, you know, tipping your toe in the water, so to speak, to actually becoming a full-time gig? I guess once I got into my mind that I saw other people doing it, 
um, who are like me, I was, I, it opened the doors to the idea that like, why couldn't I do it? And once I thought that it was something I could pursue, I went into it full force. So I ended up finding a producer and recorded my first album. And I had gained some kind of notoriety in that import industry. So I was able to start performing through that outlet of car shows to start with. And then this was around the time MySpace was big. So I also was able to chart on MySpace and then that further allowed me to kind of start performing all around the world. What advice would you give to somebody listening today who's of that age group and wants to pursue a music career? I think what you did was really strategically quite smart in terms of aligning it to car shows and stuff. But what advice would you give to somebody who's really, you know, sitting in their bedroom, knocking out the YouTube videos today to try and get noticed and try and get their music out there? Oh, man. <laughs> You're speaking to kind of a jaded musician. So I was going to like... <laughs> Probably the best person to speak to. You're going to give me a yeah. real answer. <laughs> well, here's the thing. The music industry has changed so much. I mean, it was changing so much by the time I had gotten into it because at the time I entered, there was Napster and all this music piracy happening and record labels didn't know what was going on. You're gone from the golden days where you can get a $100,000 advance to sign to a record label. That's just basically unheard of these days. Yep. Um, so what I would say if you're trying to pursue music is to build and own your own brand. You're not going to be able to depend on a record label most of the time to come and sign you. Right now they're signing like people who have a million followers on YouTube. That's They want to sign someone with a built-in fan base. So I would say focus on building your own fans and do it the DIY way because that's the way where you can really have a deep connection with your fans and what they want to hear from you. Has it become easier or is it harder today, do you think, than when you started off? I think it's harder to make money now, although it's easier to get just started because anyone with a with a YouTube channel can start at least publishing their music and getting it out there. And the process of home recording has really revolutionized. So it's really rather affordable to be able to record yourself and put music out there, high quality music. So when you were going around doing the car shows, you were getting paid for that as far as all your expenses covered and everything else? Did that work that way? Yeah. But I guess it was similar to now. I had a built-in following there. I had built that following first, and then I started. So I hadn't started pursuing the music necessarily just from scratch. So talking about travel and that, how was it going around the United States back then and, and doing that? Did you get time in most places you were visiting to have a good look around? Was Was travel still a big part of that component and attraction for you? It was a major part of it, but... I have since said that um, touring is very difficult, I guess, as a woman. <laughs> I feel like if you're a guy, you, a guy might be more partial to touring. They might be into groupies or like touring around in a van. I'm not so much into it. So, mm. and also, I think the reason I became a travel writer, kind of, I guess, blogger, is because. I love the traveling, but now I no longer have to sing for my supper. <laughs> um, it's hard to yeah. see. You definitely get travel experiences because you show up to a new location. There's the club promoter or whatever. They pick you up. They show you around town a little bit, but then it's go, go, go and prepare for the show. So you get like a taste of travel, but not the full experience. Yeah. Now, you started off solo, solo, but you ended up uh... – getting into a band how did that come about yeah I found that solo um being a solo musician even though I had like you know team members with me dancers or like my producer would travel with me I felt kind of lonely once I got into the band I really much more enjoyed being part of the band because there were just five girls and we were sisters and we was like us against the world how, how did you guys meet? Where did, where did it all come together? Um, so at the end of the day, we became five Asian girls, but it didn't start off that way and that was never our intention. 
I met my first bandmate, Kat. She was designing jewelry for this jewelry line I launched. And we discovered that we both had a love for Guns N' Roses growing up. So she had played some bass and I obviously had been singing. So we were like, okay, maybe there's a possibility of putting together a band. So we basically held some auditions and then picked up a drummer and a guitarist, um, two guys back then. But along the way, as we started performing and performing, like the guitarist left and he was replaced by an Asian girl somehow. And then the drummer <laughs> left and we found this amazing Asian girl drummer who happened to be around. And then we just yeah. ended up being an all Asian girl band by the end of the day. Now, the name of the band was Nylon Pink. Where did that come from? Um, it was actually one of the names that we had for the jewelry line originally, but it kind of has a fusion of, you know, we love pink, we're girls, and then nylon acts, adds kind of the fashion aspect because most of the girls in the band had their own distinct fashion style and were very passionate about fashion and style also. Where did you start traveling to first as nylon pink? Where were the gigs uh, coming for you? Well, it's funny, when it was just me and Kat and our drummer, Jonathan, our first gig was actually in Australia, actually in, um, it's hard for me. <laughs> okay, so full transparency, during a lot of this time, we were high and drunk as musicians are, so it's hard for me to remember every show and gig and where the, okay, so we were actually played a show in Sydney and then Melbourne. I guess in terms of what you just mentioned, um, the stereotypical view on a rock band traveling the world is one of plenty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Was that yeah. a fairly accurate summary of life as a rock band men member back yeah, then? Yeah, I mean, we're actually, me and my guitarist are sober now for many years. So that's something we actually talk about a lot and write about a lot. But back then, we were definitely not sober, and we were definitely living the lifestyle. What was that? Was it just part of the industry? Is it something that it's just so difficult to avoid? Or was it you being a little bit rebellious after having such a, a tough upbringing, as you've explained a bit? Well, um, it had nothing to, to do with the music industry that got me into partying. I think it was rebelliousness from my family. And when I got into college... The rave scene was first starting. So that was kind of my entry into, I guess, party. But it was crazy because we would go to these raves in college and the nerdiest kids would be there. You'd like go raving and you'd be like, you're here at the rave? Like everybody was doing drugs back then in college. So a bunch of girls traveling together in a band, five girls you mentioned, um, must have been fairly difficult at some times. Uh, was there some, some good fallouts at times when you were traveling? Yeah, there were some fallouts here and there, but I don't remember any huge major ones except maybe two. The thing is the girls got along relatively well and that's such a thing that people wonder, like, how did five girls get along? The bandmates actually got along pretty well. The drama always came with a boyfriend trying to be one of the girls' managers or some weird sound guy trying to um, insert control or some random girlfriend being weird. Like, it was all these side characters causing drama within the band. <laughs> did you write a book about it? <laughs> I, I should. There's definitely a source of stories there. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Now, how, how long uh, did the band stay together for and what was the ultimate uh, conclusion of that uh, coming to an end, that journey? So band was actually in its different forms around for 10 years. Mm. So it was quite a while. Um, I quit the band maybe the last two years and then I was kind of doing management and PR for them. And then I think it just kind of fizzled out after that because Kiki, my business partner, she and lead guitarist of the band, she ended up taking a gig with the Misfits. The Misfits put together a girl band. So then she went off and that took up a lot of the time. So it just kind of fizzled out at the end. Mm. Did you miss it after it was gone? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it for many years. I think it went on like I... I identified so much about being in a band that I probably stayed in a couple of years longer than I should have. Mm. 
So Wendy's listening to this podcast. What was the thought around what mum was thinking about all of this at the time? Oh, my mom hated it. <laughs> I mean, there's no way she could go to her. You know, Asian parents love to brag about their kids to other parents. Like, oh, my daughter just got her MBA from Stanford or my son just married a millionaire princess or something. You know, they're always bragging about these things. And my mom couldn't really go to her friends and say, yeah, my daughter's the singer in a rock band because <laughs> it wouldn't really impress <laughs> an Asian parent very much. Yeah, I understand. So when it came to an end, uh, did you get straight into travel writing and blogging then or, or was there another segue before you, you found that uh, passion? No, um, I guess it was maybe six months after, but we were pretty lost for a while. But basically, we had this website, and it still had some traffic on it, and we had already been writing about traveling. We'd always been blogging a little bit as a band, just like doing behind the scenes of like, hey, behind the scenes of what happened at this gig or this that gig, and it involved travel naturally because we were showing experiences from these different places. So I think eventually, it just kind of became a natural progression. And did you find that um, many of the followers that you had of the band continued to follow your journey? Was that something that was obvious at the time? Yeah, definitely some did. Some definitely were also like, what is this? And where's the music? <laughs> When's the new music going to come out? But we lost some fans, we kept some fans, and we gained some new followers. Yeah. I guess after I've had a lot of people on the show who are sports people and they talk about after they've gone around the world and they've participated in certain events for so many years and then they change life direction, there's kind of a, a sense of, I don't want to call it depression, but more of a just of a down, a downside from coming off that high of that adrenaline, I guess. Did you have the same thing when you finished doing your music touring? I'm thinking about it and I definitely... Am, I guess, somewhat addicted to the highs and the hecticness of the parts of the band, I guess. It was always very hectic and exciting. But what kind of coincided with my journey out of music was my sobriety. And I have found that being sober, I'm 500 times happier than I ever was drinking or using. So... It's hard to compare to my times of being in the band because I had so much misery during that time because there are great highs, of course, but when you're doing drugs and partying, there's a lot of really, really bad lows that I simply don't experience anymore. Was it hard to come off? It was hard. Well, the thing about me is I wasn't a period, I was a periodic user. So I wasn't like, I don't know how PC this show is or how much I'm allowed to talk about drugs. And... Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So I, my thing was Coke mm -hmm. um, and Coke is an expensive habit. So I wasn't doing it every day, mm -hmm. but you know, I'd go on binges here and there. Um, so it wasn't hard to come off as in, I wasn't having to deal with withdrawals or anything like that, but it was definitely hard as a lifestyle choice. And I definitely lost a group of friends who my only connection to was partying. And then after I stopped doing that, there wasn't as much that we could relate to. And then some of them are still partying to this day, which is kind of sad, I guess. Mm. I was going to ask you about that because I, I guess in terms of you must have gone through a process where you had a certain inner circle of friends while you were doing the rock star lifestyle and then when you change that it must have also impacted those relationships and connections to those people was was that something difficult to deal with on your journey it was definitely difficult at the time and I felt a sense of loss about that for sure but what I'm realizing now is when I was in the band there was so much drama with all these other people. Like there's always a producer screwing us over, or, like somebody taking advantage of and us. And I just don't have that in my life. I don't have any drama in my life today. So what I realized is that me being out of control during that time, I was just attracting those kind of people into my life. And now it's just peaceful. So despite some loss yeah, from you. some people 
who I did care about. There was the letting go of a lot of people who were toxic. Look, I want to thank you for sharing that part of your journey because I'm sure there's people listening who can not only relate to it, but maybe going through it right now that you've just helped out. So I really appreciate you putting that out there. Yeah, no problem. We just want to share that sobriety is more fun than... Yeah. yeah. And also in relation to this being a travel show, it just shows that you had a lifestyle that took you around the world, but it wasn't necessarily always bringing you positive benefits. So that's something I want to highlight as well, because we do talk on the show all the time about all the amazing benefits of travel, of which there are, but we've also got to see that there are sometimes dark sides to traveling and in particular what you can get involved in when you are traveling. So that's really great to hear. Now, let's get into some more positive stuff about travel writing in that I've read quite a bit of stuff that you put out there and I've got to say I'm really into it and I'm really interested to also understand about I guess how the sobriety has led to a more of an enlightened look on life is that something that you would attest to right now where you're at in life yeah I definitely think so because upon um getting sober and again I keep saying getting sober but I don't really judge anyone for drinking or partying if they can handle it I simply cannot so I, I I can't do a little bit. I, I can only do a whole eight ball, you know, like I couldn't just take one, uh, whatever, line and let it go. So um, I am accepting of all people who party and drink. Um, but as that disclaimer, um, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> I guess in terms of the question I asked was in, in regards to enlightenment uh, as part of going through that journey, right? Yeah, I think it's not possible to be enlightened when you're partying because I feel like spirituality, which I found spirituality and wellness after getting sober, like it's not really very effective to meditate while you're drunk, you know, or have a hangover. Mm. That's something you got to do most effectively with a clear head so that's only something and i feel like when i was partying i was mostly agnostic and now i do believe there's you know something out there i don't know what it is but something greater than me starting off as a travel writer and and obviously changing your life direction quite dramatically how was the early days and how did you start to build up a a community of followers what were some of the strategic steps that you took to get there um, so we started with a blog and we had a little bit of a built-in following, not huge because they were not exactly relevant. Um, but we we really just went the boring SEO initial traffic. Um, I just really am passionate about SEO. It's like kind of a nerdy obsession of mine. So that's how we kind of built the initial content on our website. And then we really focused on Korea because when we were in a band, we covered a lot of K-pop songs. And so um, two of the bandmates were Korean. And yep. we're also really passionate about Korean beauty, which is really huge all around the world right now. So that's kind of our niche with our first website, kind of just Korea, Korean mm. beauty, and Korean food. So who came with you from the band to set this up? Um, Kat, my bassist, and Kiki, my lead guitarist. Were you taking uh, an area specifically each? Was there somebody doing, you know, the travel side, someone doing the food side, or did you all dip in and and uh, work at it together? Yeah, we all kind of wrote about everything. I guess Kat wrote a little bit more about beauty just because she's not as passionate about food and me and Kiki are obsessed with food. So we wrote a lot of the food articles, but we also did a lot of beauty articles too and travel, obviously. Right. Now for everyone listening, I'm going to put all the links to Kyla's um, sites uh, in the show notes. So you'll be able to check them all out and uh, please do so because there's some really wonderful stuff there. Why is travel so important to you today, Kyla? <sighs> travel is so important to me in many ways. I just feel like, especially in this climate here in the States at this moment, it's so important for, I mean, the percentage of people that have passports in the United States is pretty low. And I feel like if everybody went out there and saw the world and met different people and experienced different cultures, they might be more compassionate to other cultures. And also just, I just love being transported into a different world. 
I love trying new foods. I love going into different homes and trying like some grandmother's recipes that she's been making that's been passed down from generation to generation. Mm. You know, something you can't experience in a restaurant here. And I just love, I guess, getting all my, I guess it's the same. I was always getting my senses stimulated with, I guess, drugs before, but now it's getting all my senses stimulated, um, like sound, taste, smell with a different country. Did it take long for those senses to come alive again after you'd beaten them up a little bit during those years? Uh, yeah, I would say even today I feel more and more because I feel like when you're, um, I guess, self-medicating or whatever, a lot of your emotions and feelings are being stuffed down. So as I kind of explore more and more wellness and open myself up more, definitely more senses and feelings are being revealed even today. How's your nutritional plan changed from the days of being in the rock band to what you do today? Well, <laughs> when you're in the rock band, you just, you know, you're in a lot of green rooms and you're eating whatever the promoter has to give you, which is definitely not necessarily nutritious. Um, I don't limit myself to eating, so I eat anything I want, but in moderation. I think that's the important thing. And... I guess I eat a lot of like small meals, but um, there's no particular kind of meal plan like, oh, I don't eat this or I don't eat that. I mostly eat everything in moderation. What's your favorite snack food when you're traveling somewhere? Uh, my favorite food when I'm traveling, the snack would just be, I want to know what the local snack is and I want to eat that. Like I don't want to mm. go... Because I go on a lot of trips where we eat at fancy restaurants, but I want to know what the everyday guy or girl is eating on their way home from work or whatever. Yeah, that's good. And I get a lot of people on the show. I actually, I have a whiteboard, I've got to tell you, in my boat here where I'm keeping a record of what my guests say to their question when I ask them or what they eat as snack food. And at the top of the list at the moment is now local snacks, which has overtaken chocolate, I must say. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of local chocolate everywhere, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. We can always do that. So what's what's travel taught you about yourself over the years? How, how have, have you evolved as a person because of all the traveling experiences you've had? I think travel has taught me several things. I think that um, I'm more, I'm very resilient, I think, and calm in I feel like when I was growing up, I kind of was very sheltered and not very compassionate and not just thinking my worldview was the right one. And I think just meeting so many other people, seeing that my idea of happiness here in the mm. States and with materialism and consumerism isn't necessarily other people's idea of happiness and people can be happy with much less. I just love opening up my mind to new ideas. And I feel like that really fuels creativity for all aspects of your life. What do you, what do you enjoy the most about doing when it comes to travel writing? I think travel writing, there's a difference between travel writing and travel blogging. Isn't travel blogging, I think it's more informational. So I just tell our readers about like, hey, here's where we recommend that you go and here's you know, the best place to get gumbo or whatever. But travel writing, when I'm writing a piece for a publication, takes me maybe five times longer, even though the word counts much shorter, because it has to be like, the piece has to craft a story and have a point. So it's not just regurgitating information and recommendations. It's like, there has to be a moral to the story. Have you always been a writer? Have you always enjoyed writing? I've always written a lot, just simply in college, I had to write a lot of essays, but I never was so much of a writer until I started travel writing. And then I started really reading different travel pieces that were moving and inspiring. So yeah, that's what really inspired me to get into writing. Now you've got a, a book out, a, a co-written book that's called The 30 Day Travel Challenge. Can you tell us about the book, how the idea, first of all, came about and what it's about? 
Yeah, so I am obsessed with 30 day challenges. <laughs> I feel like they're just like, there's such a good way to instill a habit into you. So I've tried so many different ones, like 30 day challenge or 30 day like clean living challenge. And then when I looked around, there was nothing for travel. And uh, there's so many people when we're, you know, posting photos or blog posts. And they say, oh, I wish I could travel. I wish I could afford to travel. And they feel like it's unattainable for them. And I really do feel like with a proper planning and savings mm. plan, travel is attainable to anyone. And travel doesn't always mean international far-flung location. Yeah. You could simply go to a nearby city and explore it and, you know, take a staycation over the weekend. And that constitutes traveling too. So we kind of just wanted to put a 30-day challenge together so there's bite-sized actions that you could kind of do with a group and each day would focus on a different aspect of first week is kind of wellness and getting your mental state ready for manifesting more into your life and then after that we get into the nuts and bolts of different planning and travel hacks and different things like that. So let's talk about that um, mental state. Are we talking uh, meditation? Are we talking other practices to get yourself into that kind of state? Yes, and we actually had some feedback. Sometimes people purchase a book and they're like, why is this first week, why does it have nothing to do with travel? And that's just because of our personal belief. Yes, I think the meditation practice, like if you want to manifest more of anything into your life, whether it be travel or you know, love or more money, you have to have your mindset right. So the first week has to do with like journaling, meditation, kind of setting some visions and kind of woo-woo stuff if you're not into it. But we think it's really helped us. Look, I really love that because you've just made me remind myself of a, a recent situation I had. I had a friend uh, who went traveling from the United States for the first time and never been out of the country before and had never experienced jet lag. And I said to my friend, look, you know, you've really got to prepare yourself mentally for this. There, there are things that you can do to prepare prior to leaving your, your hometown that's going to help you with this jet lag situation. And I kind of got boo-hooed and said, oh, I'll be right, I'll be fine, there'll be no problem, I won't get jet lag, blah, 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 blah. But of course, what happened? There was a huge downer because of the jet lag, and there was a huge impact on the whole trip because of the jet lag. So I love what you're talking about here, because it's really putting yourself in a state of, of calmness and preparedness to undergo, whether it be a you know a 14-hour flight or whether it be something that's uh, you know even putting yourself into a culture you're not, not used to. Yeah, because when you're traveling, I guess if you haven't traveled a lot before, you may not realize that all kinds of Murphy's Law situations happen when you're traveling. Mm. So you got to be really ready to roll with the punches and be kind of easygoing and loose. So the 30-day travel challenge, what are some of the other things that you've put out there to help people overcome some of the, uh, I guess, not only stigmas, but also myths associated with traveling? Well, so our book is really for the beginner traveling traveler so we also just deal with just basic like budgeting and figuring out hidden costs that you may not realize because the worst thing to do is to go on a trip and then you know come out with 500 extra expenses that you didn't budget for so we talk mm -hmm. about things like that might be obvious to a seasoned traveler like budgeting for tipping and for different surcharges or for you know things like sim cards because the average traveler might just plan with their like hotel and their flights and meals and then forget about all the other incidentals that can add up. Yeah, that's a great point because often uh, you get home from these holiday experience or traveling experience if it's not just for a holiday and you can be quite surprised with how those things add up quite quickly and it can actually take a bit of shine off the experience, can't it? Yeah, definitely. Mm. How's traveling changed um now that you're writing about the challenges of travel versus when you were back traveling the world as a, as a rock star, are there things that you're putting in the book that are, are different today because of the technology that we're using to book flights and all those sorts of things? Um, has that changed over the years? Uh, that is a good question. I would say I don't know how many flights we booked on our own as a band because there was always a manager doing that all for us. But in the last 10 years, um, I would say... Airbnb didn't exist so much when you're in a band. So 
that's been such yeah. a huge transformative mm-hmm. aspect of the tourism industry. So I'm actually Airbnb my place now. So it's just crazy that people can now have this side source of income. I just on Ubers, um, how convenient it is to be able to go to a foreign country and be able to use Uber on your app. You know, instead of dealing with a foreign taxi driver who may not speak the language and you don't know if you can trust them, etc. No, it's really opened up a whole new world as far as traveling goes. Look, something else I noticed in terms of your ability to help people when they're traveling is you actually have got quite a novel way of choosing what to pack and put in your suitcase when you actually travel. Can you share with my listeners what that process is when you want to pack uh, light, lightly oh, for a trip? Well, you know, I am a huge Marie Kondo fan. <laughs> I, you know, the whole thing with her, she wants to make sure that anything you keep in your house or bring with you needs to spark joy. So I hold each item to my chest and just, you know, see if it gives me that little zing of joy. <laughs> and, or if it's something that I have to bring with me, you know, like my, uh, phone charger or whatever. That's not going to give me a zing of joy, but I certainly need it on my trip. So only things that are essential. So if I have the sweater, like, oh, I don't love the sweater, but I might be able to use it maybe on Saturday night after dinner. No, I don't bring that. What are a couple of the brands that you always have to travel with in your suitcase? Uh, I don't know the brand offhand, but there's this charger, this world charger that I have. And I think it's like some, but I cannot live without this Mm. thing because I just show up in any country and this charger has like six different outlets and the USB chargers and it has all the different countries, um, plug-in things. What are those called? Um, so wherever I go. So that's one thing. What's something else that you have to have in your suitcase? So what else do I have in my suitcase? I can't think of anything brand name, but there's this one um, jet lag pill. And I think it might be just like, what is it called? A placebo effect? Because I don't know what's in it and what it does. But I always take it. And I could give you the name of it afterwards. It's really cheap. I buy it off Amazon. And I take it every two hours while I'm on the plane, both arriving and returning. And My jet lag is not that bad. I mean, I've dealt with some horrible jet lag bouts in the past. And since I've started taking this pill, I just don't experience it so much. The 30-Day Travel Challenge book, where can people get this from? Uh, You could get it off Amazon. We love everything Amazon. (laughs) Okay, so it's on Amazon. I'll put the links to that. So people wanting to take on Kyla's 30-day travel challenge can get their hands on that. Now, Christmas is fast approaching, and I know that you're still probably digesting your Thanksgiving dinner, but have you got any travel plans for Christmas? Yeah, I'm actually headed off to Croatia next week to Dubrovnik and checking out the Christmas markets, which I've never seen, but I've heard that the Christmas markets in Europe are a sight to see. They are outstanding. How long will you be there for? I will be there for 10 days, so excited to taste that holiday food and see all the Christmas cheer. (laughs) Yes, I bet you will be. Now, have you become an avid photographer since you've been doing the travel writing and blogging? Is it something that goes without saying that you're taking a lot of photos and stuff? Is that something that's developed over the years in terms of your photography skills? Yeah, I think I definitely developed more skills, but I would say that Kiki, who I travel with frequently, she's actually more of the photographer. Mm -hmm. I, you know, can point and shoot and maybe see a good portrait perhaps, but she actually can understand aperture and all that stuff. I have no idea. Any uh, skill sets from your rock star days that have transferred over to your new life as being a travel uh, writer and blogger? I just feel like we traveled in such horrible conditions sometimes that anything that happens to me traveling now, it's like everything's easy. So it's given kind of a tough skin. Mm, fantastic. So it's it's good to look back on though because you've uh, you know you've lived that life, you've been there, you've done it, and now it's a whole world of new experiences. Yeah, everything's easy now. <laughs> Tell me, when you're on an aircraft, are you a, do you have to sit on the window or the aisle? I have to sit by the aisle just because I have like a real paranoia of 
needing to go to the bathroom and having to ask a sleeping person to wake up. Um, and I'm always so mad when somebody who's not sitting in the aisle seat has to go to the bathroom multiple times because I'm like, why do you choose the aisle seat if you knew you were going to go to the bathroom a lot? <laughs> so you're definitely an aisle seater then. Yeah. I mean, I love the window, but I, I just, I can't not have access to the bathroom. Mm. Now, I'm interested to know, I'm sure my listeners are as well, you've been to so many places around the world in, in both lifestyles that you've lived so far. What, what are a couple of your favorite places and, and why? Well, definitely Taiwan. I, I might be biased just because I am Taiwanese and I spent so much of my childhood there and the food's amazing and the nightlife. Um, second of all is Vietnam, which was a surprise to me. I had no idea that I would fall in love with it so much. Also the food. Um, I'm not a huge fan of pho here in Los Angeles, even though we apparently have some of the best pho in the world. And that's what everybody loves to eat. But in Vietnam, there's a world of food beyond pho. And the pho there is different from the pho here. And then there's all kinds of banh mi sandwiches that we don't have here in the States. And I feel like Vietnam is just kind of like a Thailand before Thailand was discovered by the world. It's still kind of slightly under the radar as compared to, say, Thailand, which is on everyone's radar. So you're predicting a massive uh, tourism increase for Vietnam? I hope not, <laughs> just for my sake, <laughs> but possibly, yeah. Now, a lot of people listening to my show are very avid travel writers, bloggers. Um, they're people that uh, write into social media. You have an, a massive following on social media. How did that come about and what do you do strategically to grow your social media audience? I carried some of my social media from different things I did in the past. I had a little bit of built-in following from the car show and then the MySpace and then the band. Uh, but it was, I lost a lot of that when I got into travel writing because they were like, what the hell are you doing? But what I think if you're starting mm -hmm. off is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. If you create amazing content for the brands that you're collaborating with, they're naturally going to repost it. And if you meet amazing people and create content together, then you'll both be posting about each other. So brand collaborations, you might work for free when you first start out just to get the exposure and um, just meeting new people, networking and collaborating with them also. Yeah, yeah, great idea. And uh, how's social media changed for you? Is there a particular platform that, that you enjoy? I've, I know that a lot of the travel bloggers I've had on my show recently have got quite frustrated with Instagram and they're kind of getting on the back more of Twitter. Is, is that something you're experiencing or what are you finding uh, as the best platforms as, at the moment? I hate Instagram. <laughs> but Instagram is a necessary evil. If you're a travel blogger, it's just essential. You can't not have one because every brand's going to ask about it. So I maintain it out of necessity. Um, I can't say that I love any social media outlet. I love Google SEO because I feel like that's predictable. It's not like some algorithm. Well, it's not predictable. There's like updates or whatever, but... It's a little more logical than Instagram algorithms. I am currently exploring TikTok. Um, and I'm having fun with that because I'm just taking old, you know, we have such huge backlogs of video content as travel writers. And I'm just throwing some especially entertaining clips on there. And what I really love about TikTok is that you can have 10 followers. But if you put on an amazing clip, you can get a million views which that would almost never happen on Instagram. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So TikTok is one that you're riding the wave with at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have my eye on it. I'm playing with it. Fantastic. So where do you see yourself in five years from now? What's, what's the master plan with your whole travel writing and, and blogging experience? Is it something you see yourself doing for a long time? Yeah, I think I just want to, I definitely will def be still in the travel writing space, but I just want to kind of speak to women around the world about being able to lead unconventional lifestyles and not be scared to pursue their dreams, no matter what their society or family's expectations are. So I kind of to help inspire other girls to not feel like they have to leave their lives in boxes, you know. Mm. 
I love that. And the reason I love that is because I'm already noticing, you know, I'm, you're my 82nd guest on my show. Um, so thank you for being number 82. But the really amazing thing that I'm finding is that the majority of my guests are ladies and they're ladies who have got out there and they're traveling the world and they're doing their incredible adventures by themselves and they're taking ownership and they're independent and they're strong and they're they're showing what's possible and I really love that and I, I love what you just said that that's going to be a keen focus of yours moving forward as well. Yeah, I just feel like it's so important. You know, I didn't necessarily have as many role models back then, I guess, the internet's allowed us to connect with so many people now. And it was a little more limited when I started. So it's exciting just to see people. I'm able to find people to inspire me and hopefully be able to pass that knowledge on to others. Who inspires you in the world today? Who inspires me in the world? How to narrow that down. Immediately, I think of Lady Gaga, um, which wouldn't be what the average travel writer might say, but she's not a conventional beauty and she just goes out mm. there and creates music and does things that don't fit the pop formula. She blazes her own path and she does her own thing. And I feel like with a prolific duration of social media so many people think like this is what I need to look like or I need to look like a visco cam girl if that's how you say it vsco there's this whole stereotype and of the life you have to portray and I think it's so important for people to mm. embrace their individuality and just be themselves no matter what that is and there will always be people to relate to whoever you are mm. I think that's a great one I think Lady Gaga is a, a great one to have there Los Angeles, is it going to be home for a long time for you or do you see yourself moving from there in some time? Yeah, I absolutely love LA. It will always be my home, but I would love to have a second home in maybe Taiwan and then somewhere beachy. Yeah, good. Well, that's a good goal to work towards and I'm sure you'll get there with the determination that you've got. Now, one last question I've got before I let you go today. Any regrets about the journey you've had so far, the rock star lifestyle and now moving into the travel writing space? I think gosh, I had a lot of fun while I was in the band, but I wish I wasn't so out of my mind for some of it. There's, you know, parts of things where Kiki will be like, remember when this happened? And I'll have no recollection of it because I was so wasted. So that's the only thing. I wish I was more sober for more of the time. But, you know, everything ends up where it is and I'm happy today. So maybe that's the exact route I needed to take to get here. That's a beautiful answer and a great way to end our time together. We've rushed through an hour there, Kyla, and it's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on my show today and sharing with the listeners your amazing journey from traveling the world in a rock band to now taking up and putting out a 30-day travel challenge book for all of my listeners to get hold of and to find out how they can better prepare themselves for their beginning trips around the world that's fantastic so listen i'd love to have you back at some stage so, so feel free to reach out whenever you've done some of your trips maybe after you've done the christmas markets in europe you can come back and tell us all about how that was definitely would love to come back terrific kyla thank you very much for joining us on the global travel channel until next time i wish you bon voyage thank you there we are that was kyla you speaking to us from los angeles today on this episode what a fantastic journey she's had from being a member of a rock band traveling around the world and now being a travel writer, blogger and author of the 30 day travel challenge book. Fantastic story. Thanks Kyla again for coming on the Global Travel Channel podcast show. If you're out there and you're listening to this particular episode and you're looking for more episodes from the Global Travel Channel, head over to our website at www.globaltravelchannel.com. You'll find all of our previous episodes there and don't forget you can download them from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play and a host of other locations that are all listed there on our website. Now if you like our content that much why not share it with your friends and family and work colleagues the more people we can get listening to the global travel channel around the world the better. Also if you know anybody that would like to be a great guest on my show then point them in the direction of the global travel channel. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram so plenty of ways to be able to get in contact with us. Okay so that's it for this particular episode. My name is Mark Philpott and it's been my pleasure bringing you the Global Travel Channel podcast show. Until next time I wish you all bon voyage.